Hello. So I'm welcoming you for the second time, very warmly. And uh, in other words, you've already been welcomed. So my name is Venerable Chanda, and um, some of you may know me, but I'm just a, a young nun who's living in England, and I'm a disciple of Ajahn Brahm um, in Australia. He's much more famous. And um, I wanted to share something this week, weekend about contentment because through my uh, teacher I've learned a slightly different approach to meditation than the one I was trained in, in Burma, which was much more of a disciplined and very um, focused um, practice with a lot of uh, emphasis on sitting for long hours and sitting through pain and really sort of striving for enlightenment in a sense. And that gave a lot of benefits to a certain point. But something about the joy was missing. And the Buddha said that there are different paths in Buddhism. You can have the long path full of suffering, or the short path full of suffering, or you can have the long path full of happiness, or the short happy path. So I don't know which you prefer, but I think the short happy path to the end of all suffering sounds quite appealing. And so this idea of bringing contentment into the way we perceive experience can help us to start developing happiness early on in the practice and noticing the happiness that's already available to us, if only we weren't looking somewhere else for it. Yeah. So while you're here, the encouragement is to really delight, first of all, in having nothing to do and doing nothing. Okay. So I want to stop this manic sort of thing inside that keeps on pushing us to attain and strive and do better and become somebody and improve myself, you know, and all these reasons that we sometimes come to meditation. A lot of them very wholesome motivations, you know. We want to bring the best of ourselves into the world and into our dealings with other people. We want to fulfill our potential. But when we approach meditation from a sense of lack or a sense of longing, unfortunately we're actually fueling and perpetuating the suffering that we're here to overcome in the first place. So these things are very subtle and we have to be careful. And so the encouragement here is really to abandon any sense of getting anywhere else or making any kind of progress in meditation. Okay? Forget about progress. We're going to give up hope. That means we're going to become <laughs> hopeless cases. Not basket cases, just hopeless cases. Okay? So you start from zero. And that's fine. You can stay on zero. It doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Now, that may sound a little bit weird, like shouldn't we have some kind of you know, direction or make some sort of effort? And that's true, but most of the effort you've already made by arriving here on your cushion. You know, you've done a lot of good in, in your lives. You've let go of a lot. First of all, just develop a sense of contentment with what you've left behind. Content to have put it over there, maybe in New York City, somewhere else in New Jersey, I don't know where you've come from, but whatever you've been doing today, whoever you've been dealing with, or the problems at work, that is left behind. Yeah. So Ajahn Chah said, we meditate not to attain things, but to let go of things. So first of all, we let go of our busy lives, and of all the reverberations of those lives that go on in our head between our ears. Yeah. Sometimes we carry that world into the meditation hall, and that's okay, you know, you can make peace with that, give it some space to settle. But don't worry about anything. Nothing's going to go wrong in a day and a half. You know, a day and a half is not a long time to be together. And we don't have to get anywhere, you've arrived already. So just practice being more fully where you already are. Yeah. So the goal, if there is any goal, is just to make peace and to try and find ways of developing contentment with what we already have, where we already are whether it's in an aching body, a tired body, with a restless mind, yeah, with doubt, why am I here anyway, what's she on about, you know. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Just learn to give it space, because the mind that's going to develop peace is a spacious mind. It's a soft and gentle mind. It's not a hard mind that's demanding in nature. In the chanting we're going to do tomorrow, it says that one who wants to develop loving-kindness is easily satisfied, not demanding in nature, yeah, contented. And all these beautiful, soft qualities that allow the heart to grow. So we want to grow our minds into spaces where, which can receive experience, and all of experience, not just the bits we like, 
but even the bits that we normally try to run away from, turn away from, or reject. Yeah? So the Buddha laid down a very beautiful teaching, and it was actually for the first bhikkhuni called Mahapajapati Gotami. She was the Buddha, Buddha's maternal aunt. His uh, mother died seven days after his uh, birth, and then his maternal aunt took over the upbringing of the Buddha-to-be. And uh, when she went forth as a bhikkhuni, she wanted some advice on how to practice. She said, you know, just give me the teaching in brief. And the Buddha said, you can know that it's the Dhamma and it's the Vinaya. The Vinaya are the kind of um, training rules that we take up as monastics. But you can also consider that as any kind of virtuous conduct, yeah? whether you're a monastic or a lay person. You can know that it's the Dhamma and that it's the proper way to live by whether it leads to a sense of disenchantment. And that means a disenchantment with all this suffering and all this busyness and the worldly things that really tie us down and wear us out. Yeah? A turning away from that. He said, if it leads to dispassion. So contentment is very similar to dispassion. Contentment's in a way the antidote to wanting. Yeah? If you're content, what is there to want? You already have everything right here, right now. Wanting is always a sign of discontent or restlessness. So if we can develop contentment, that really undermines the main hindrance to meditation and the main cause for suffering. So this is how contentment slowly stops that world of suffering. That's what we mean by stopping the world, this world of suffering within ourselves. Yeah? That is the world. Our own experience through our sense doors is the entire world for us. Sights, sounds, sm- smells, tastes, touches physical sensations, mental thoughts. That's our world. You know, we can't experience that unless we come into contact with it. So when we talk about ending that world, we mean pacifying, calming, stilling, and stopping the wanting for something different, which just fuels the whole process. Yeah? And keeps you moving from past to future, you know, memories, fantasies, anything but being here right now. So contentment can be seen or um, described as a kind of satisfaction, a deep satisfaction, a peace, an ease, a sense of ease. And it kind of is very related to qualities like loving kindness, (coughs) qualities like compassion, and also letting go. Yeah, The end of suffering, the opposite of wanting, is letting go of wanting, letting go of craving of desire, of this constant chase for sensual pleasures and distractions and yeah, anything that will just give us a bit of a break. But unfortunately we're looking in the wrong place most of the time. So the Buddha talks about um, contentment in various parts of the suttas and during this retreat we're going to talk about contentment mostly from the perspective, not necessarily as a state, because you could describe Nibbana, the ultimate goal of Buddhism, as a state of very deep ultimate contentment, yeah, with no more wishing, no more wanting at all. You have everything and much more than you could ever expect, the highest happiness, yeah. That's the definition of nibbana, the highest happiness, an unconditional happiness. So we can think of that as a sort of synonym, in a sense, for contentment. You know, the word happiness in the West is often thought of as something quite stimulating and quite, you know, usually does refer to happiness through the senses, But Nibbāna is the going out of all those sort of happinesses, the real pacifying, the pacification of what the Buddha called sankharas, any kind of mental volitional action, basically will, which keeps us being pushed from here to there, trying to make, trying to do, striving. Yeah. So that's, the, the main, that's not the main way we're going to look at contentment because most of us aren't going to get enlightened. And as I said, you can just give up hope for that right away. So it's, it's a day and a half, okay? And I've been at it for 24 years and am I enlightened? Well, life's getting a bit easier. <laughs> and when it isn't, then I realise, that's discontent creeping back in, right? But um, we're going to look at contentment more as an attitude that we can pick up and use in our meditation. So, in a way, a lens through which we look at experience, a way of regarding our experience. Hmm? So sometimes we think that mindfulness is this bare awareness, and that mindfulness is always objective, and whatever we look at, you know, we can just see it as it is. And that is the goal of mindfulness, but that's actually not possible as long as what we call the five hindrances are operating. Yeah? Do you know what the five hindrances are? Yeah? 
Well, the first one again, wanting, desire, especially for any kind of experience through the senses. And the senses are our world, right? The second one is aversion. So it's the opposite. It's the other side of the coin. As long as there's craving for something, that means you don't want what you've got, right? So it's almost the same thing. It's just the opposite side. You know, you have a very lovely day. The next one's not quite so nice, you know. Somebody lets you down or, I don't know, the retreat didn't happen. Somebody didn't show. And it turns into aversion. Sometimes the happier you were, the worse you feel when that happiness ends. So it's like swings and roundabouts. You know, you're always going from one to the other. So craving is the sort of root of all of the others. It's the chief hindrance. Ajahn Brahmali calls them public enemy number one, these five hindrances. And then the, set, the third one is, um, if I'm getting it in the right order, I think sloth and torpor. And it means a kind of sluggishness of mind. It doesn't necessarily mean physical tiredness because sometimes that is just physical and you need to rest. So tomorrow we're only getting you up at six. So even if I seem to be going on a long time, you'll still have, I promise you'll have eight hours sleep. Okay. Well, I don't promise you'll sleep. We have the opportunity for eight hours sleep. So that's not bad. And, you know, during the day you'll have time to rest. And, you know, it's not an army camp or a concentration camp, as Ajahn Brown says. It's a stillness camp. It's a peace camp. Yeah. So we're going to peace out together or whatever. Maybe <laughs> bliss out. Let's see. But we're not expecting that. We're just expecting to be calm, be kind, be content with whatever happens. Yeah. And then the, uh, so the sleepiness, is, don't worry about too much. It's usually physical, so go easy with that. And then the next hindrance is um, restlessness and remorse. Sometimes it can be translated as uh, worry and restlessness. So the reason we talk about remorse is because it's really important to have virtuous conduct and, and remorse is a direct consequence of basically n- n- doing something that wasn't very skillful and harming another or harming yourself. Yeah? So whenever we break the five precepts, for example, we drink too much or, you know, we, I don't know, shout or abuse, even harm somebody physically, even an insect, as we were saying. You know, we, uh, we're living a violent life. We're causing harm and that hurts us, first of all. We can't harm another without hurting ourselves. You know, when you meditate a lot, you see that it's impossible to break the, the sealer without first harming yourself. There has to be a defilement of greed, hatred or delusion before that can turn into unwholesome speech or unwholesome conduct. So we've harmed ourselves already, and we harm another. And worst of all, the remorse comes up afterwards, and we feel really bad about ourselves. So that stops us being able to settle in our own mind. And then, of course, the worry is another kind of aversion. You know, It's sort of looking at the future with negativity. We don't know what the future holds. We really don't know. Maybe it won't be as bad as we think. Maybe it'll actually turn out totally differently than we think. The Buddha said, well, however we think things are going to be, they'll always be different. And that includes these things called jhanas, deep states of meditation. We think we know what we want, but we don't really know what that is at all. So we might as well just forget it and understand what's arising now in our minds. That's the only way mindfulness has a chance to work. We have to make the content of experience available to mindfulness so that mindfulness has a chance to stay with that experience for long enough to, for insight to arise. Yeah? And then the last hindrance is uh, what we call doubt, and it usually, usually doesn't mean the kind of doubt that's actually uh, inquisitive and that's really looking for answers and is quite open. It means a kind of sceptical doubt which already rules something out in the first place. It can also mean confusion, yeah, not really knowing which way to go. And in those kind of states of mind, I think it's better not to make decisions just to wait until things clarify yeah, before we actually decide, especially on serious decisions in our lives. <clears throat> so these five hindrances the Buddha call, um, de- defined as obscurations of the mind which weaken wisdom. So again, you know, we're not seeing things clearly. It's like if you have a sense of, like you see somebody that you think is very attractive and suddenly lust arises for that person. At that moment, you're not seeing that person clearly. You know, maybe that person is just, yeah, somebody who suffers quite a bit, or I don't know, maybe they smell in the morning, maybe they're actually not very nice to be around. <laughs> but all you can see at that moment, you know, is, is this object of desire, and so you want something from that person. Sometimes that blinds us to their faults, and we get into all kinds of unhealthy relationships. 
you know? Also with a version, somebody says something. Maybe they didn't mean anything by it, but it reminds you of something someone else said in the past who you didn't like. That person reminds you of someone you didn't like. And immediately, you know, the perception is twisted and you start expecting a bad behaviour. And whenever you expect somebody to behave badly, they start behaving exactly that way because your perception has filtered anything else which will show something different. Yeah. So if I already decide, oh, you're a kind of, I don't know, bubbly, friendly person, then every time I see you, that's what I'll expect of you. And my perception won't allow for you to be grumpy one day. You know, you're always expected to be the way I want you to be because that's the way I've labelled you. And it feels horrible to be boxed in, doesn't it, when somebody boxes you? It doesn't give us the freedom to grow. So we want to keep this very clear mind, which is always open and seeing anew. So the Buddha also said that the hindrances are the things which nourish delusion. And this is a problem because delusion is a root cause of suffering. So it's also a a positive thing in the sense that hindrances nourish it. So although the Buddha didn't say there's an ultimate or definite cause for ignorance, he did say there are things which feed it. So by undermining these five hindrances, we start to develop wisdom, the opposite of delusion. So in a way, you could say the whole purpose of the Buddhist path is to start to undermine these hindrances so we have a chance to see clearly. And the Buddha said it's only when we have these experiences of very deep samadhi that we can see things as they really are. There's a possibility to see things as they really are because the hindrances are not operating. And the mind, he said, is soft. It's malleable. In a sense, it's content. It's content with whatever arises. So even difficult things such as the truth of suffering, the truth of impermanence, the truth of non-self, we're able to see them because the mind's big enough, the mind's content enough, it's stable, yeah? It's not afraid, it's not rejecting the truth. It's not invested in a different truth. It's not saying, no, 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 things can't be impermanent. Something in this world is permanent, let me see that. It's actually objective for once. So we're starting to undermine these hindrances. But as I said, mindfulness is not always enough. Because another aspect of mindfulness is that it operates as a gatekeeper. It's, you can't just say, right, I'm mindful. I'm mindful of all the defilements. That's great. You know, oh, you know, aversion, aversion's coming into my mind. Great, aversion, aversion, hatred, hatred. Hitting somebody, hitting somebody, strangling somebody. <laughs> you know, you can be very mindful that you're doing that. But is that really wise? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the Buddha said mindfulness is for a specific purpose. It's to end suffering, right? Its function is to start to undermine the hindrances and to see deeply into the nature of things. So all this sort of modern-day mindfulness, I suppose I I was going to say I don't want to give it a dig, but I suppose I'm going to. (laughs) Often, you know, it, it talks about things like mindfulness of eating chocolate and how it tastes and, you know, all kinds of sensual pleasures, which is good to get you into the moment in a sense. But the purpose of mindfulness is not just to try and get more enjoyment from the senses, it's actually to see that these senses are not a reliable place to seek happiness. <laughs> yeah. So mindfulness has a specific function. And as it grows and as we start to overcome these hindrances, we direct mindfulness onto four areas of existence. And they're the four areas that the Buddha described in the Satipatthana Sutta. I don't know if people here reversed in the Buddha's teachings particularly well or how much you've heard, but the Satipatthanas, the four Satipatthanas, are basically areas of our experience in which we assume there to be a self. Yeah? We assume there to be some kind of existing entity that's permanent, that's me, that's my soul, my spirit, my essence. Yeah? So those areas were the areas of the uh, physical, physicality, you could say, so body, and then feeling, and that includes mental and physical feeling. The area of mind, all sort of aspects of the mind, whether the mind's great or, or um, how could you say, mahagata or small, or whether it's uh, subtle or gross, any kind of attribute of the mind. And then dhamma, which means the contents of the mind. Actually, it relates to the Four Noble Truths and the Seven Enlightenment Factors, but that's another whole big story. So any of these areas of existence, basically, are places where we still cling, we still suffer. And so the whole point of mindfulness is to be able to uncover 
the truth of these things, yeah? the impermanent nature, the nature of suffering, and the nature of non-self. So we have to start to undermine these, and, and contentment and other beautiful qualities such as loving kindness, compassion, gentleness, letting go, these are the right intentions that the Buddha talked about, the right motivations, the right attitudes. All these things help that protective function of mindfulness by keeping out the defilements of the mind which distort the truth. Yeah? So that it's almost like having friends in your home so that you can keep the burglars out. There was this very funny thing that happened in Perth once. I mean, sometimes we can be mindful of things when they're very coarse and bright and sort of enticing. So there was this couple, and they're really good meditators, but one evening they were watching the television. I don't know if it was football or something like that, you know, or maybe a a thriller, some kind of movie. And they were so engrossed in this movie that at the end of the movie they turned around and they looked behind them, and they saw the shelf was empty. And a burglar had been into the house and taken all the things from behind the shelf, quite expensive things, while they were watching this television show. You know, and this is an example of being mindful but not having the protective function of mindfulness happening at the same time. You're just so focused on one thing that you miss everything else. And so these burglars could actually come into the house and do what they needed to do without these people even knowing. While you're here, I actually encourage you to behave like burglars, not in the sense that you're going to take anything, okay? Don't get me wrong. But uh, it's like burglar meditation. That's one of my teacher, Ajahn Brahm's... um, definitions of being quiet and and considerate for each other because you're sharing rooms so please be content if your neighbor does make a noise or if the floors squeak or somebody's in the shower and you want to get in you know try to develop a sense of uh, patience with that yeah oh great somebody else is enjoying the shower for like five minutes ten minutes 15 minutes <laughs> like I think you're only supposed to go in there for five or so so do be quick but anyway we try to develop you know a way of looking that undermines our own negative reactions to that but at the same time we walk around quietly and we're very mindful of how we're opening doors and again mindfulness means knowing why we're opening it and how we're opening it yeah so we're not opening it to be noisy or to just get through really quickly, we're opening it to be quiet and to get into the meditation hall quick. Actually, there's not even a door, so you'll be pouring into the meditation hall in the morning very early. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm waffling and you're tired. So we're going to add, we're going to add this beautiful, wholesome quality of contentment to the way we see our experience, to the way we look at experience. And as I said, you know, that is very close to things like compassion, you know, kindness. So it's like you infuse your awareness with these beautiful qualities. Instead of just, okay, I'm sitting here, let's see what's happening. We actually look and start to develop a sense of friendliness towards our body and mind. Yeah. Notice if your mind's a little brittle or tense or tight and just relax and give it space. Make a wider sort of um, area, in a sense, of your mind. You know, Increase the range of your awareness. Sometimes we can focus in on the painful part yeah? and we start to get really upset about that. But if you just like back off a little bit and have a look at the way you're relating to that pain, the pain itself might not be a problem, but the way you're relating, the I don't want this, this hurts me, my knee is going to need an operation, you know, this is what really consolidates the pain. So in that space between what you're observing and the observed, There's a space there, and in that space you can put these beautiful, wholesome qualities, things like contentment, making peace, stopping the fight. I really love this idea. Making an armistice. It means making a ceasefire. You stop arguing with what's happening, and you just give it space to be. And when you start to look at that pain objectively, with a soft mind, you start to notice it's not that bad. Sometimes it's quite interesting. Sometimes it's just different sort of sensations of pulsing or throbbing or maybe some dull kind of ache. But there's lots going on there and it's changing all the time. So it's very different from saying, my knee hurts. If you say, oh, there's pulsing, there's tingling, that immediately undercuts the suffering. Yeah? So we're patient with these things. We stay with them long enough to befriend them. So the result of this... Uh, adding contentment and making contentment our goal is that we're able to stay in the present moment for longer than we expected. Because it's craving and aversion that take us away from the present and into the past and the future. Anywhere but now. 
as soon as the craving and aversion start to cease, there's nowhere else to be but in the present moment. And when you're really in the present, you know, really focus sharply in the present or softly in the present, what is there to think? Instead, the attention starts to go inward. It stops going onward into the next thing or outward into something that hasn't happened or something that happened years ago. And it starts going in a different direction, inward, into your experience. Contentment also makes peace. It's so close to peace. Yeah, and it's so close to silence. When you're content, you don't need to comment. You're just experiencing life, very fresh. And also, you're making good mental karma. There's such a thing as karma, and we can do that by actions of body or speech. Now, here you're going to be doing great karma because you'll be helping in the kitchen. I don't know what else you're assigned to do. You won't be speaking, so you can't break that precept. That's the hardest one to keep. So when, you, when you're in silence, it's great. You've got that one sorted. But then the mental karma, like what are we doing with our minds? No one can see. I don't know. You might look like a rock, but inside you might be full of agitation. It's impossible to judge that. So don't worry if you see everyone else sitting like a Buddha. We all have our own struggles, yeah. We really can't judge. And it doesn't matter if you sit on a chair... If you stand up during the meditation, if you stretch, just try and do it quietly, but that's fine. We want to be kind to our bodies. We want to be compassionate. Yeah. So try not to measure yourself. Contentment takes away the measuring mind. It's just content to be exactly who you are, where you are, with whatever experience you have. This measurement really creates a lot of suffering. We measure ourselves constantly comparing ourselves to others, comparing ourselves to the way we think we should be, the way we used to be. I mean, my mind used to be so much brighter and sharper. And, you know, I often compare myself to the way I was, you know, in my 20s or 30s. And I'm not the same now. But can I be content with that too? You know, different qualities have arisen, different qualities are maturing right now. And it's just a beautiful growth. We're seasoning ourselves, we're seasoning our minds. So try not to judge that and give your mind space to grow in its own way. All of us are going to be different. You know, the spiritual path will look completely different for everybody. So we don't measure or judge. It really has no meaning. The Buddha said that there are three conceits. And one is the conceit that I am better. That's obviously quite conceited, right? But we all think we're better than someone, if not many people. And the other one, of course, is I am worse. Now, this often happens too, especially if we have sort of negative conditioning or we've just been raised in this sort of through the school systems through the education systems especially in uh, western society we're always trained to see what's wrong right that's called critical thinking and so we train ourselves to see what's wrong within so a lot of us really self-deprecate we put ourselves down constantly and deprecate already should ring alarm bells because it's so close to fabricate we're just creating a self-image it doesn't exist so we're just imagining that we're worse than others or we're worse than we think we should be. But all of that is really irrelevant. Whatever you think of yourself is quite irrelevant because it's going to be something different. So try and meet yourself anew, as if you've never seen yourself before, as if you've never seen the next breath. You don't know what a breath looks like. Each breath is completely unique. Yeah. And then the other conceit which surprises people sometimes is, I am equal. Yeah, sure, you're just as valuable, you're just as worthy as anyone else, but you're not, the, you're not equal. We're different. We're all different. Yeah. But any kind of measuring is a cause of suffering. So we're going to put down the measuring mind and we're just going to see what it's like to arrive exactly where we are now, with depression, with tiredness. Imagine if you're depressed and you're content with being depressed. What happens to the depression? <laughs> the beautiful, amazing thing about working with perceptions in this way and developing uh, attitudes and ways of looking at experience is that you start off by looking at experience through the lens of peace, for example. So you make peace. You make peace. Something difficult, you make peace with it. You just keep letting go. You just keep making peace. After a while, you realize that what you're observing is peace. It's really fascinating. I had an experience in the Rains Retreat this year in um, Australia and, and usually I absolutely love being on those retreats and it's three whole months of meditation practice. 
But for some reason, a lot of doubt and even despair was coming up in my mind. And one day I was sitting there just wanting to cry. And and I didn't really realise. I thought, I'm just being there with it. I'm being equanimous. I'm just sitting. I'm being mindful. But after a while, I realised I was quite tight and tense. And I just remembered that instruction, make peace. And immediately I got a little bit of distance. There was suddenly a space. It was like, oh yeah, there's me here and there's this despair. And I have the ability to influence the way I'm regarding this. I can't change the despair and I shouldn't try to because it's there to teach me something. But I have some ability to relate to it in a different way. I mean, this wasn't a conscious thought, but I just remembered the make peace. And as soon as I was able to just open my mind and develop a sense of compassion as though I was looking upon the despair the way maybe a mother would look on a suffering child or the way maybe an older, wiser part of myself, a loving elder sister may look at it, infusing it with love, you know, just holding it and cradling that and saying, you know, I care. I'm going to stop the fight. Immediately it changed. It almost vanished instantly and turned into bliss. Very strange. And we don't do it to get the bliss. This is the thing. Because now you hear that, there's the danger that you'll think, right, I'll make peace so that it turns into bliss. But that's just another kind of bargaining. So (laughs) the mind's very tricky. (laughs) But the point is, when we really get this attitude right, and for a moment we're able to let go, things pacify, still, and cease. And this is the direction of the Dhamma. Whatever leads to peace, to cessation, to enlightenment, you can know this is the path of the Dhamma. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Okay? So we don't get to peace by fighting. We get to peace by making peace. So that's the only thing we need to practice for the next day and a half. Good. So that's enough for me for the night. And if you would like to have a little stretch, I'm not going to... um, give you a break yet unless you're really 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 dying for the toilet because we want to do a little bit of meditation just to calm the mind and make you all sleepy and ready for bed body's different and that's the way it should be For about 20 minutes, because I promise you'll get eight hours of <coughs> <laughs> Closing your eyes if that's what feels comfortable. And gently allowing the impressions of the people here, of the journey you took to get here. of the things that happened today, gently just allowing those impressions to fade away. Noticing what's missing No more busy streets, subways. No more people in the office. See if you can notice the delight in the absence of noise, busyness. 
rushing around. The delight in just being still. Finding a sense of contentment in your meditation posture. If there are any areas of the body which feel at ease. Noticing that ease. And the delight of a comfortable, relaxed body. And equally, if you notice any areas of tension or pressure, perhaps you've crossed your legs in a way which is pressing your ankle against the other leg or against the floor. Out of compassion, just gently move, asking your body how it feels most at ease, respecting that. You may wish to experiment with your spine, whether it's comfortable to be completely erect, or perhaps just slightly relaxed, or even slightly leaning back, especially if you're on a chair. Noticing the position of your head. Seeing if you can find a position where it feels most balanced and supported. Perhaps slightly tilted forward. Perhaps you can give your neck more space by gently, very gently lifting the crown of your head. Just really taking care to listen into your body and to do what you can to care for it. And as you continue to feel into the body you may notice areas which are still aching or tight. You may have an injury or a mu- pulled muscle in your back or neck. Sometimes we can't adjust the posture. But we can adjust our relationship towards the pain or the ache. So in any areas which feel uncomfortable, see if it helps to give them a little bit more space. Maybe just spreading your attention from that area outward towards the edges of the body or towards the extremities, the palms, the soles.
Maybe adding kindness to the way you're aware. Offering a sense of loving presence to whatever arises. as though viewing your experience through kindly eyes, with understanding, with care, without measuring or finding fault, but with a sense of curiosity and interest. How can I be with this? How can I develop contentment with this, this experience which is arising for me right now? See if you can give equal value to every experience, whether a thought going through your mind or the silence between the thoughts. Whether a sensation that you find agreeable or disagreeable. Or maybe you become aware of the breath. Whatever it is, allow that experience to just melt into the mind. Be embraced by kindness, warmth, friendship. to settle more and more fully into now.
Allowing your mind to rest in the present moment. Giving value to the present. This is good enough. And as the contentment and peace develops, you may find you start to notice the delight in simplicity, in wanting little, in just being in this moment, the only moment you'll ever have. making peace, being kind and being gentle with whatever you're experiencing. So the meditation is soon coming to an end. But before you open your eyes, just reflect on what it felt like to meet experience with kindness, with a sense of contentment. And see if you can continue to develop that attitude, the skillful, wholesome relationship with whatever you experience as you transition from the meditation to your rooms, maybe to the bathroom and into bed. Whatever you're experiencing, whatever you're performing at the physical level, Make the quality of your awareness, your relationship to experience, the most important thing of this retreat. <laughs>